Welcome to the Radically Christian Bible Study Podcast. I'm your host, Wes McAdams. Here we have one goal, learn to love like Jesus. Today we have part two of our two-part series on the Christian and violence, whether or not it's justifiable for Christians to use violence to defend themselves and to defend others. If you haven't heard part one, I would encourage you to go back and listen to part one that we released last week, and I hope that you enjoy part two of this conversation. conversation has been so rich, and I, I so appreciate everything that, that's been said. Let's kind of deal with some of the arguments that, that I've made, that I've heard other people make. Um, one of them is that there is so much in the Bible about war and violence. Um, I, I think that, that a lot of people hear this conversation that we're having, and they probably you know say, oh, yes, yes, I can see how you get that out of some of the things Jesus said or some of the things Paul said. But there's so much that would lead a person to believe that God is not, God is not a quote unquote pacifist, that God, God is okay with, with his people using, using war at times uh, to do what is good. And so there, there's so much in scripture about soldiers and, and, and war um, and, and using violence uh, for, for reasons that God ordains. Um, in fact, uh, during the break, uh, it was brought up about John the Baptist. When people were coming to him uh, for baptism, some of those people who were coming to him were soldiers, and and he tells them not to steal, to be content with their wages, but he doesn't tell them to stop being soldiers. Um, and a lot of people will use that as sort of an argument uh, for uh, for the position of pro pro violence. Uh, so so how do we we how do we deal with those those types of arguments, Stephen? What are your thoughts on that? I would argue that that's one of the strongest points that you could make uh, if you're trying to argue for violence. And so I, I think it's important to address it and, and recognize that it's a strong, it's a strong point. Uh, what I would argue is that the fact that there were conflicts, physical conflicts in the past, it does not necessitate or require future physical violence. The fact that something has happened in the past doesn't mean that it needs to continue happening and we recognize that with lots of things, like nobody would argue that since there was two, there were two world wars in the past, we must of necessity fight more in the future. No, we try to avoid those as much as we can because they're they're terrible. And so I think that comes back to what you said earlier about having this view of the of the coming kingdom or the arrived kingdom at this point that we have to we have to view scripture in the narrative that it's presented in the arc that we're shown. And there is a point in time where the kingdom is, is sort of is physical. Like you have this nation that's been chosen out of all the other nations for God to, to, to demonstrate his power and his love and his blessings that they're supposed to be. The, the kingdom of Israel is supposed to be the city set on the hill. They are the lights in the world. They are the salt that is supposed to make the world salty. They are supposed to show what it means to be a follower of God to the rest of the world. And the prophets will will bear that out. Where later you have ten men coming and, and tugging on the cape uh, of an Israelite, saying, "Take me to your temple. Show me your God." You know that was the plan. And so when you have this physical kingdom, you know there's going to be times where that kingdom has to be defended, and the lineage through which the Christ is going to come must be preserved. And so because there are those physical things, God is dealing with those in a physical way. And ultimately, what I think we see is, is those physical things in the narrative arc of Scripture are intended to give us pictures. You know, Paul takes those images of warfare in places like Ephesians 6, and he transforms them. You know, we're not fighting flesh and blood, but we're fighting the principalities in the air, you know, the power, the power, the cosmic powers of darkness. Uh, and the way that we fight against those things is by taking up the armor of God, not the armor of Caesar, and that that now is the fulfillment of all those things in the past, the, the picture made complete, so to speak, in which we do fight. There is a war going on, but it's not against Russia or you know, any other country that you might pick who is your current enemy. That's not the conflict we're fighting. Uh, 
it's against Satan and the present power of darkness. And our weapons against those things are not physical in nature, but they're spiritual. And so that's sort of how I would work that in and try to explain that. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon? Brandon? Well, um, I, can, let's, let's come back. Stephen introduced kind of the idea about, uh, you know, some of the Old Testament stuff in the physical kingdom and, and the defending of that. I think a perspective that needs to be a part of the conversation. And admittedly, when you're talking about the violence of the Old Testament, you're introducing a very big, complex topic. It's not the purpose of it, but I want to dip a toe in it for a minute. It's often the case in those Old Testament settings that God, through the prophets, cautions them from thinking that their safety and stability and prosperity is tied up with their military strength. In other words, their ability to inflict violence or to repel violence. And oftentimes, even in the scenes where you have what someone would might refer to as divinely sanctioned war, where God says, go to war with these people, in many of those cases, that comes as the result of failure of people to do, to trust in God, to deliver them through his own means. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, there are plenty of stories in the Bible where no violence, you know, no one lifted a sword. And yet God intervened and brought deliverance to his people. You know, you can think about when uh, they, they were at the Red Sea and the Egyptians were behind them. You can think about when uh, Rabshake brings the Assyrian army and surrounds Jerusalem. There, there are all these situations where you would say, OK, if there's ever a situation to fight, this is it. And yet they put their trust in God and God offered deliverance. And, and you know, quite frankly, those are the greatest stories we have in our Bibles. Those are the ones that we all, you know, do VBS on and stuff because they're so amazing demonstrations of God's capacity to deliver us from seemingly inevitable circumstances. And yet it's often when the people don't trust in God. Like, I wonder what would have happened if when the 12 spies came back, if the people said, if God says we can have the land, we can have the land and they go in. That doesn't happen. They say they've got walled cities. They've got giants. In other words, they have superior military capabilities. We don't stand a chance. Okay. Well, what follows with the next generation? Yes, war follows the next generation. I just have to wonder what would have happened if, if they had just said, if God says it's ours, it's ours. All right. And then you, uh, you fast forward, for example, with Saul and the Amalekites and all that. Saul, the king, was not something that God was trying to establish. That was the rejection of God as their king that resulted in them having this monarchy to begin with. You know, the famous statement, you know, God makes the same. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me by wanting this king. They wanted to be like everybody else because everybody else did it this way through military violence, et cetera, et cetera. So even in that setting, I think there is an alternative path to consider that had humans chosen that, had the Israelites chosen it, there was a way to have circumnavigated violence even in those situations. And sometimes they did. Now, more specifically to the thing with John the Baptist, that is, like Stephen said, you want to make a good argument, there's, there's a good place to start. Now, it's a good argument in one sense, but it's also based on a lot of assumptions. Okay. Um, I would imagine there were a lot of things that John could have listed that they needed to abandon that he didn't. Maybe he picked some of the ones that were most prevalent. In other words, them abusing their power for their own selfish gains. And so he rebukes them, you know, tells them, don't do that. Um, but at the same time, if we're going to assume that that means, okay, since he didn't say stop being a soldier, then the assumption is it's okay for them to continue and then, of course, do what soldiers often are are ordered to do by their superiors. Um, what well, can we not assume the other, that the assumption is that if they become followers of Jesus, they will continue in that role. And yet if told by a rival king, Herod, Caesar, whoever, they bow the knee to King Jesus first. And King Jesus says, no, I, I don't, you don't kill your enemies. So, is there space for those who are in those positions? Well, you're talking about, you know, uh, military or soldiers today or then or whatever. 
to serve Jesus without violence, I do believe that the answer is yes to that. Um, and I personally know Christians who are in the military who who have pursued avenues with their careers where they will, you know, say, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill anybody. It's just not going to happen. Um, and I believe there's some pretty amazing stories throughout American history of some things that have been done by soldiers who conscientiously objected to killing, not to, they're not objecting to serving their country. They're objecting to killing. And uh, there's been some pretty amazing stories of things that some of those believers have done trying to trying to straddle two fences, I guess you could say. I want to be loyal and help my country do my part, but I'm also not going to compromise on the values of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Luke? <clears throat> well, I would ad agree with what's been said so far. Um, I think in the original question that you kind of sent out as we were just getting our thoughts together, you said, doesn't the fact that the Bible is full of God-ordained wars and godly warriors prove that it is sometimes necessary to use deadly force? And I, my initial response to that is I, I think it proves that God is sovereign mm -hmm. um, and that God ultimately gets to determine how he intervenes in the affairs of this world and how his followers also do. Um, but there's all sorts of things to, to, to take into account, which have already been mentioned. You know, uh, Israel was a theocracy under the, the leadership of God, even when they, when they had a king, that was the understanding that, that kings were themselves supposed to be submissive to, to Yahweh. Um, that, that's not our context now. Uh, you know, if, if it were, and God were to tell us to go to war today, then, you know, well, we should pay attention to that. But that's, no one seriously argues that God is telling us as a nation, or, or I say us, any nation to, to, to go to war um, so, so that's a, a totally different context. Um, however, there is a sense in which this sort of question or, um, uh, argument does give me pause. I mean, so if you were to rephrase it and say something like, well, is it ever appropriate for followers of Yahweh to go to war? Well, the answer would have to be yes, based on scripture. Like we have seen times when followers of Yahweh indeed were supposed to go to war but I don't think that necessitates that followers of Yahweh, especially as revealed in the way of Jesus the Messiah, are still supposed to be engaging in that. And that's not to disregard the Old Testament, but it is to acknowledge that we are now new creations, um, that something has fundamentally shifted uh, from the way that it once was. Um, now, having said that, like pragmatically, realistically, I, I do think that we live in a fallen world. And sometimes from the perspective of nation states, it is sometimes necessary as a last resort for governments in order to protect their citizens uh, to engage in warfare. And, and that's a God-given responsibility of governments. But it's a major leap to say, therefore, that Christians should be a part of that. And, uh, you know, Brandon's already kind of hinted at, at some of the distinctions there. Um, but just because it might be this side of, you know, the return of Jesus when Satan, sin and death are ultimately defeated, just because it might be at times necessary for one nation to defend itself against another, doesn't automatically follow that Christians should be engaged in use of lethal force. Yeah. So many great thoughts. I wish that the, the trouble with having uh, three of y'all on this call is that, that I want to follow up on everything that, that everybody has said because you, you, you've you all shared such great thoughts. I, I do want to to kind of piggyback on something that, that was brought up. The idea that 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 I think what we're sharing here, at least what I what I hear us sharing, is not that we are anti-military or we are anti-soldiers. In fact, I would argue that that I take the perspective that I do first and foremost because of what I think the New Testament teaches about the way of Jesus, but secondly, because I love people, which includes soldiers. 
I love soldiers. I love I love our soldiers. But but here's the thing: Jesus tells us that I'm supposed to even love the the soldiers of the countries that my country is fighting against. I'm supposed to love my enemies. I love human beings. I love all human beings, and I think that that's exactly what all of us are saying. And so I think when there's this this visceral gut reaction to anything that smacks of pacifism or or anti-war and and people you know have memories of of what happened after soldiers came back from uh, from Vietnam and and soldiers were spit on and and disrespected and and that's not at all what what we're saying here we're not saying that we don't have respect for um, or love for soldiers in fact it's because we love people and we realize that war is 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 awful, is horrible, um, and is hor- horrible for everyone. It's horrible for uh, the, the citizens of the countries in which these wars are fought, and it's horrible for the, the soldiers and for their families. And so I love, I love my, my, my friends, my neighbors, my brothers, my sisters that, um, that are soldiers, um, and, and, and I, I think we're called to, to pray for them. I also think we're called to, to pray for our enemies as well. Um, let's let's kind of shift gears just a little bit here. We've we've talked a lot about Jesus and what Jesus has said, and we've sort of made the case that Jesus is is anti violence. But I'm, I'm sure that there are probably listeners who are saying, "Hey, wait a second! Didn't Jesus tell his apostles to sell their cloak and buy a sword? I mean, he insisted that they go out and and buy a sword. So so what do we do with that? And and isn't Jesus condoning uh, violence or at least condoning uh, having a weapon? Many people assume uh, for for self-preservation. So, Stephen, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, Luke 22 there? Um, just a really quick piggyback off what you said. I think I, I agree. I think it's important that we stress that we love all people. And there are going to be brothers and sisters who disagree with the conclusion that I have. And in that disagreement, I'm not calling into question their faithfulness, their relationship with God, their salvation, any of those things. We're just trying to learn and grow together. And and this is a passage uh, in in Luke 22 that comes up quite often. And I think if we, if we look at where it shows up in the context, it's in, it's in this discussion that Jesus is having with the disciples around the last supper. And they have shown several times that they don't understand what the kingdom is yet. They're, they're, they're still thinking in very physical ways, very very earthly ways, fleshly ways. And, and so there's this, this tension in all of those discussions with uh, the kingdom that Jesus is talking about and the kingdom that the disciples are expecting. And so when we, when we come to this, we should see this tension. And, and we see that even with Peter, when Je- after Jesus' words, Peter's like, well, here's two swords. And, and Jesus is like, well, that's enough. If the intention was to create an armed band to go and protect themselves, you would probably want more than two swords. So that there's something else going on. What is happening here? When you look at the rest of the narrative, they're going to find themselves in the garden. The, the soldiers, the, the, the temple guard is going to show up, and Peter immediately is going to whip out one of those swords and chop off Malchus's ear and, and instead of saying, you know, good on you, Peter, now go get another one, Jesus says, stop. And then immediately he heals Malchus's ear. And then he turns to the others, uh, to, the, to the, the guards, and he says, have you come out against me as a robber? And I think that's significant because it goes all the way back to the prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus was going to be numbered with the transgressors. And so this has to happen in order to fulfill all the things that are spoken about the Messiah. And if you think about automatically, if you were to hear that somebody chopped off a cop's ear, you know, somebody attacked a police officer and cut his ear off, automatically, what is that person to you, right? Well, they're a lawbreaker. They're a transgressor. And so here in this scene in the garden, you have now Jesus numbered amongst the transgressors. He's going to be brought to trial. He's going to be executed as an insurrectionist. It is the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament. It isn't Jesus saying, all right, everybody grab a sword and let's go defend ourselves. Because when the moment arrives of his arrest, he stops that from happening. And so, yeah, I, you can qu- question and ask, well, why does he even bring that up? And I, th- I think that that's what's going on, is this moment where all Scripture is being fulfilled in Jesus. And it's actually, in my mind, it's actually a moment where we see that violence isn't the answer. 
-hmm. Because rather than urging that violence on, Jesus stops it and undoes the violence, which is exactly what he's coming to do. He's coming to undo the curse of sin, and he's coming to establish this kingdom in which there is no violence. And I think we see a beautiful picture of that. Yeah. Brandon? Stephen, um, let me kind of piggyback off. I don't have anything to add to that. That's exactly where I think this whole text needs to be understood is, you know, uh, immediately after that, Luke quotes from Isaiah 53, the, not the part about the suffering servant, but about his being numbered with the transgressors, counted among the transgressors. And, um, you know, we never want to lose sight of the fact that everyone involved in the arrest conviction and crucifixion of Jesus is complicit in that. In in many cases, they knew that they were doing wrong and did it anyway. In the case of the, you know, the Sanhedrin, some of them, they they knew that they were buying off witnesses. They knew that they wanted him taken out of the picture because they feared he was going to get them all killed. They, they knew that. Uh, Pilate knew that he was an innocent man, said execute him anyway. So they are all complicit. Now, but I want to say something else about that. Even though they're all complicit, never lose sight of the fact that Jesus is in full control of everything that is happening with his life and death. And he is orchestrating events to culminate in this moment. Um, This doesn't just happen to him passively. He is conducting what's happening here. And, you know, earlier in the temple, I think Jesus does some things that are meant to be the spark to ignite the powder keg, the cleansing of the temple. All right. He knows what the result's going to be of that. Going and, and publicly rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees as hypocrites um, in his last, you know, temple appearance. He knows what that's going to lead to. And in in this case, in this event here in the garden as well, I believe his statement about the swords is just another piece in the ending that he is orchestrating, wherein he's going to be falsely labeled as a revolutionary threat, just like the prophet said he would. Jesus is providing Rome with the evidence necessary for them to put him on a cross. That's the reason they're going to kill him, because it's going to be said, This guy's a rival king. He says he's king, not Caesar. And we arrested this guy. One of their dudes came with swords, tried to fight back. You know, in other words, he's given them everything they need to then do what they're going to do. Now, even with that, this is where they don't lose their complicity. Pilots, you know, has the trial and goes, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no reason to kill this guy. But I'll do it anyway because they say, well, you know, hey, you're no friend of Caesar's. If you, if you don't, if you let this guy go, then there you go. And it's interesting, isn't it interesting that in the story that Barabbas is the one that they choose to leave, who literally is a violent revolutionary. He is an insurrectionist who uses violence to try to overthrow the Roman government. And so, you know, when you read these stories and, and we have these pushbacks on this, there's a part of me that thinks, you know, we, we're still trying to choose Barabbas all these years later. We still want the violent one, Jesus Barabbas, as opposed to Jesus of Nazareth, who is the peaceful one. Um, so, you know, I just, yeah, I, I get that. And, and I, that was one of the first scriptures I used to jump to was, you know, hey, he's the one that tells them to go get swords. Um, but I think there's a purpose. And in, in, uh, and then there's another possible interpretation. You know, some 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 commentators think that, that Jesus is just making the point that, hey, this is not going to be like it was before when I sent you out two by two. Um, It's going to be hostile this time. You better prepare yourself for what you're about to go into the lines then. You need to be ready for it. And the disciples, as they often do, misunderstand his point and, and go, oh, well, hey, we've got a couple of swords right here. And some translations on the, you know, it, it is enough don't give the impression that he's saying, okay, those are enough swords. It's kind of like your mom saying, all right, that's enough of this. I don't want to hear any more about it. He sees that they're misunderstanding, and he's like, all right, that's enough. That's enough. 
y'all are not, you're not tracking with me here. So let's shut this down. So those are viable options also of how you can understand that text. Luke? <clears throat> well, these guys have done a really good job addressing this. And the only thing I would say maybe to, to reiterate, um, I do think that you have to pretty intentionally disregard context to read this verse and then think that somehow it's this great support for violent self-defense. Um, because first off, like, wh why would Jesus tell his apostles to do this? Well, directly in the context, it says why. I mean, verse 36, he tells them to get the sword. In verse 37, I tell you this, that scripture must be fulfilled. I mean, it's directly related to this. Um, so he just, he's, he's quite forceful about that. Um, and then again, the time that we see one of the disciples use the sword is Peter. And Jesus rebukes him. And he said, you know, the famous... He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. If there was ever an opportunity for Jesus to give his support to a disciple exercising uh, violent self-defense, this would be it. And instead, he does the opposite. He, he rebukes Peter for doing just that. And so when we look at this in context, um, I, I just don't think it's the argument that people would like for it to be. And I think, in fact, it's the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of going long on time, I know, and uh, but I think that this conversation deserves a, a longer episode than we, than we usually have. Um, this isn't something that, that I put in, in the notes, but it's something that just came to me that, that one of the, the arguments that I often hear, and it's probably one that, that I've made, and, and to me, it's still the most um, reasonable, at least... Uh, human reasoning uh, type of a, an argument for violence. And that is, isn't it, isn't it wrong or even immoral um, if you have the ability to defend someone else, kind of set aside the idea of self-defense for a second, and, and talk about defending other people. And I, I often hear the argument that that it would be immoral to to not defend someone else, a weaker person, a, a defenseless person, a helpless person, if we can defend them violent with violent means by force, then we should. In fact, we must defend people. And so I often hear a a, a moral argument, not necessarily based in or rooted in scripture, but but rooted in an argument that seems very reasonable. In fact, I, I think I've even made this argument from the pulpit before, uh, that 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 Christian people should care about defending the defenseless. And and if we can defend people, then we must defend people. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I, I hate to, to spring this on you, but uh, Stephen, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it comes back to maybe the idea of what is the highest and best good, and you know uh, what is going to drive our ultimate decision is what is the highest and best good. And if if we think that the loss of life is the worst evil, and so the best good is the preservation of life, then we would act one way. But that's not what we see in Scripture. You know, we see Jesus saying, don't fear the one who can only kill the body, but fear the one who kills the body and then could throw you into hell too. And so we have to recognize that that's not the highest and best good. The highest and best good is the idea of uh, sharing the kingdom, sh bringing people to the king uh, and bringing people out of the darkness into the light. Um, and, and when we begin to look then at you know, what you're suggesting is if I see somebody getting beat up, should I intervene? Yeah, I, I don't think saying that we shouldn't kill people is the same as saying that we should sit there and watch somebody, you know, have their lunch money stolen, right? No, you should intervene. You should speak up. You should say something at least. And if that means that you get beat up instead of them and they get away with their lunch money, then you just did what you're supposed to do. Sometimes the way that you intervene is by taking the violence cast upon others onto yourself instead. And we don't like that, but that is what you see. That's turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, doing all those things. And so absolutely, you should intervene. But that doesn't mean that you kill somebody. It means that maybe you sacrifice yourself. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, it, that really is imitating Jesus to the nth degree. I mean, I, I, I don't... I, I am so uncomfortable with this argument that people make, primarily because it casts aspersions on Jesus himself. Jesus himself 
had plenty of opportunity to intervene violently to defend other people and didn't. And so if we're going to say that it is immoral to not intervene violently in defense of the defenseless, then you are accusing Jesus of being immoral because Jesus never did that. Uh, Jesus allowed John the Baptist, for instance, uh, to be executed, and he could have stopped John from being executed. Arguably, John was saying, hey, why am I still in here? Uh, you know, why why haven't you delivered me? And Jesus allowed his cousin to die when he could have defended him. And and he offered his own self, his own life. And and in, interesting, Stephen, that you said about the the greatest good. I would I would argue, and I think I think you'd agree that that Jesus is about the preservation of life. But the paradox of the gospel is that we save our lives or gain our lives by losing it. And so it's actually through losing our life that we actually preserve our lives. And that's the paradox that Jesus taught from beginning to end of his ministry, that if you want to preserve your life, you have to lose it. You have to sacrifice it for his sake and for the gospel. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to preach a sermon on that one. But uh, Brandon, any any thoughts on on that question? Well, two thoughts. One is um, that's a different question than the one that we're addressing. The question is, should we kill other people for self defense or defending other people? All right. The the question that you posed is. Should Christians, because they will not kill, et cetera, just do nothing? Well, that's a different that's a different question. That's not the one that we've been addressing. And too often when this topic comes up, that's what happens is the train jumps tracks in the middle of the conversation. And it's like, well, not, you know, I don't know anyone uh, personally. Now, I'm, I'm sure you find somebody, but that believes that's why I don't like the word pacifist is because, again, when people hear it, they think just passive. Jesus was not a passive person. He resisted every day of his life, but he did so nonviolently. So it's not about a lack of resistance. It's about how do we resist? The second thought is this. Imagine how many of the stories that boggle our mind and inspire our faith that we would be robbed of if throughout Christian history, the approach was, well, we've got to kill in order to protect this innocent person. Um, it, you know, John is the one who told us there is no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Um, the, the story that I referenced earlier about the Amish girls, those little girls, God bless their, you know, the one that passed. Well, they were not passive. They were not, you know, just non-resistant. Those little girls said, if you have to kill someone, kill me. So I don't like the, the false narrative of, well, if you're not willing to, you know, kill people, then you just think we should just sit back and let evil run rampant and and the innocent suffer. And that's not true at all. And and I think that is a gross misrepresentation of this position that I hope nobody listen, if you want to critique my what I believe, do it. You know, I welcome it because if you show me weaknesses and flaws, you're only going to make me a better person. You know, if you show me hey, you're just wrong, you're only going to help me. But don't be disingenuous and create a straw man that you attack that I don't agree with anyway. You know, I'll, say, I'll join you. I don't agree with that either. So uh, th that's something I think is really important when you bring up those situations is remember what we're discussing. And that's a separate issue that we can also discuss yeah. if we need to. Luke, let me let me go ahead and, and transition to the this third question and, and, and toss it to you. And, and that's the idea of of the government. I'm sure that, again, people that are listening, I'm sure are thinking Romans 13, Romans 13. Why aren't they talking about Romans 13? And and Romans 13 certainly says that God God uses uh, human governments. God ordains uh this the 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 government to act with the sword uh, to uh, to uh, punish evildoers and and if that's true if God ordains uh, or uh, appoints uh, 
the the government to act as his servant in punishing evildoers, then how could we even suggest that it would be wrong for God's people, for Christians, to participate with the government in punishing evildoers? So what, what would be your, your thoughts on that, Luke? So I think this is a great question. Um, and I would begin by... I believe that Romans 13 teaches that, that God does ordain governments and that it is God's plan that humans be ruled by governments. Um, that's not to say that uh, every person who wins an election or every military coup that is successful, that God is specifically choosing that to happen. I think it's teaching in context in Romans there that that in a chaotic and sinful world that God has chosen to restrain the chaos and sin of the world through order brought about by human governments and that part of what governments are supposed to do is protect their citizens. And sometimes that means use of the sword or violence to punish evildoers. So I guess to begin with, I, I affirm the premise of the question um, because I do think Romans 13 is teaching that. However, um, again, kind of going back uh, to, uh, we talked about the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking to, disciples as to how disciples are supposed to live. He's not addressing governments there. And this, again, kind of goes back to we have God's kingdom and we have the kingdoms of the world. And uh, God does not expect those to look the same. In fact, he expects them to look very different. That's kind of the point. Um, And uh, the assumptions that we sometimes have where we want to overlay these things very simplistically and say, well, they, they all have to follow, but they, they follow the same rules. It really gets us on the wrong track, I think. Um, and so, again, talking about the Sermon on the Mount. So these are Jesus's words recorded by Matthew, uh, carefully placed within his gospel. And I just I, I cannot imagine that Matthew, as the author and compiler of that gospel, that he, he didn't design his gospel to answer questions about Christian participation in government-sanctioned violence um, because that, that was just outside of the realm of possibility at the time. Um, same thing with Paul. I mean, Paul's talking about a government, but it's, it's, it's a Roman government that ultimately is going to kill him, right? And, and so, again, this in some ways this goes back to what we talk about in Christian history and this shift that occurs. Uh, we're living – hundreds of years, uh, centuries and centuries on the other side of this, where it would have been unfathomable to say, well, okay, you're a Christian. Now, now you're, that means you're a part of the power structure and you're going to decide whether or not you're going to be actively involved in this government that's doing these things. Um, so it's like, it is a good question and it's, it's important to think about. I don't think it's just easily dismissed, but we have to acknowledge if we're going to be honest here, that our context is just vastly different than the first century in which these texts were written. Um, and having said that, like, this is why for me, like, <laughs> this is in Romans 13. Romans 14 is about disputable matters. And it's like, there is a sense in which it's like, I think we have to give grace to people when they come down in different places on this. Um, because to some degree, we acknowledge that there are different texts that are kind of in tension. I mean, there are places like Romans 13 where government sounds pretty good. Um, and there are places like Revelation 13, which it seems like it's the beast and his influence and it's pretty terrible. Right. And so we, we acknowledge that, um, that our, our new Testament texts are, are situational and they're addressing different contexts and different situations. Having said that, I'm not disregarding it, but I don't think it's untenable or incoherent to say just because government has a job means that Christians are justified in playing by the rules of government acknowledging that the kingdom of, the, of this world are different from the kingdom of God. And so that that's kind of where I am. And I acknowledge like it's not a foolproof response or argument, but I do think biblically it's undeniable. Like as Brandon talked about earlier, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, there are kingdoms of this world that are actually in opposition to God's kingdom and yet still under God's sovereignty have jobs to do. But that doesn't mean that it's the jobs of Christians to help them carry out those things. And so it's like we can be good citizens. Um, We can be uh, relatively 
patriotic and allegiant to our governments. But at the end of the day, like we must obey God rather than men. And there are times when the kingdom of God comes into conflict with the kingdoms of this world. And I would say this is one of those examples. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I agree with what Luke said. The The kingdoms of the world and the kingdoms of God, the kingdom of God are different. And you can see going back to the early Christians, just to get their viewpoint on it, uh, Origen said, you cannot demand military service of Christians any more than you can of your priests, referring to the pagan priests. We do not go forth as soldiers for the emperor, even if he demands this. And so they, the early believers recognized that harming another human being, killing another human being, was a point at which they drew the line. And they said, we cannot do that. We will pray for you. We will we will honor you as emperor. We will be subject to you, but we will not kill for you. And so they drew that line. And I think that, that it's important to go back and look at the text even. And the point that Paul is making is to let every person be subject to the governing authorities. He doesn't say go and join them. He says be subject to them. So the fear perhaps is that now we have this new king, Jesus, so we're going to be anarchists, right? We're not going to submit to any of the rules. We're not going to listen to anything the government says. And Paul says, no, 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 that's not how this works. You know, you're living in Babylon, which, by the way, I think I am too. You know, we live in Babylon. So while we're there, we seek the good of that nation in the context of my service first to King Jesus. And so I am subject to the government that is over me. I pay my taxes. I do not speak ill of those who are in power. I refuse to say bad things about the president, which will get you in trouble. I might disagree with policies, but I will not attack him personally. I will not call him names. I will not say anything like that because that's not who I'm called to be. I'm called to be an obedient, law-abiding, you know, civil uh, person within the, the country and context of my life. But that doesn't mean that I wage war for Babylon. Uh, quite the opposite. I recognize that my nation is under the power of darkness. You know, the ruler of the world is also in control of my nation. Far from being a Christian nation, the United States is, uh, and, and I love my, I love the place I live, but the United States is amongst those nations that are under the power and influence of the evil one. And so there will be things that happen that my government does where I have to say, I cannot do that. I can't be part of that. I'll pay my taxes. I'll honor the rulers. I'll follow the laws, but sometimes there are lines that I cannot cross. And this would be one of those lines for me. And as was mentioned earlier, you know, if I was pressed into service, uh, you know, maybe I'd be a medic. Maybe I would shuffle papers. Maybe I would drive a truck. But under no circumstances would I be comfortable taking up arms in an attempt to end another human's life. I just couldn't do that. And so that's how I would answer it. I think Luke hit the nail on the head. With it's different. It's not the same kingdom. Yeah. Brandon? I think this is kind of like the previous question we were talking about is we have to be careful that we don't make Paul answer, answer a question that he's not being asked. Um, you can't divorce chapter 13 from chapter 12. Um, and in chapter 12, he seems to be addressing this question of, okay, when we as believers are enduring persecution, likely from government, but you know, whoever else, um, what do we do? Can we fight back? Do we stick it to them? You know, do we, you know, hit them where it hurts? And he's, he's saying, no, 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 that, that's not the way. And he goes back and he cites the Sermon on the Mount, you know, and that's how he closes chapter 12. And then what we call chapter 13, he's like, now look, don't think that evildoers just get away with their evil. There's a system in place to deal with those. It's just not your job. Uh, you're not the ones to retaliate. There is a mechanism where evildoers are held accountable, and it's just not you. Ultimately, is it God? You know, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But so how does God do that? Sometimes God uses the instrument of even pagan governments. Um, now, I will say this. We need to be careful that we don't think that God sanctions everything that a government does, even though he may use that. And I think the book of Habakkuk can really help us with that. You know, Habakkuk's like, hey, this isn't fair. Babylon, they're worse than we are. How can you use them to destroy us? God says, hey, the story's not over. They will receive justice too. 
But right now, you're receiving justice. They are the instrument through which I'm delivering it. Then I'll deal with them. And I think that could be something that could help the, the Roman readers know, look, Rome is not getting away with anything by what they're doing. Um, they will be held accountable. And the book of Revelation pretty well, you know, lays that out as, as clearly as you can see. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? You know, patience. I'll execute justice against, you know, them, even though sometimes I may be able to take even the evil that they do and turn it in ways that brings about good, you know, which he says earlier in the letter, God Evil doesn't stop God from being able to accomplish his good. Uh, now, God doesn't ordain the evil. And so if Caesar uses the sword in his hand in an evil way, which he's going to, God doesn't ordain that. God doesn't endorse that. But neither does that prevent God from being able to accomplish the good that he's accomplishing. Evil is not more powerful than good. That's ultimately what the story of it is. So, you know, yes, you know, Rome, Romans 13 is, is an important passage, but Paul's not answering the question, okay, so can we instead join the Roman military and then stick it to our enemies? You know, can we kind of, is that a loophole? You know, we can't do it as Christians, but we can do it as Roman citizens who join the, you know, the Praetorian Guard or whatever. Um, that's not the question that he's answering. So we've got to be careful that we're not making him answer something. That Guys, not thank you all so much for all of your thoughts on this. I, 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 I love that we're ending on what you were saying just now, Brandon, about the justice of God, and that sometimes God's justice against evildoers does come about through human governments. Uh, God ordains governments for that purpose and reason, to restrain evil and to punish evil. But ultimately, God will deal justice God will God will set all things right. God will destroy all evil and sin and and wickedness in the world. And really again to go back to an earlier point, the reason I believe in the way of Jesus and the way of nonviolence is from an eschatological position because I believe that we are living in the kingdom of God, but ultimately, I believe that the justice of God is coming, and so I can surrender my enemies to the Lord and know that He will He will deal out vengeance. It's not lost on me that it's easy for those of us who live in comfort and safety and don't have to worry about uh, being persecuted or, or killed every time we turn around. It's relatively easy for us to have this conversation, um, and if I was talking to somebody who was living in a country where they were constantly in fear of their life, I would, I would encourage them to, to trust the Lord, that he is going to set all things right. And ultimately, I think that's what we have to, we have to believe and trust in, that we can uh, turn the other cheek because we know that God's, God's will will be done, God's justice will be served. So brothers, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been rich. I appreciate all that you do uh, for the Lord and for his kingdom. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Christian Bible Study Podcast. If you have just a moment, we would love for you to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you're listening. It really does help people find this content. I also want to thank the guests who join me each week, Travis Pauly, who edits this podcast, Beth Tabor, who often volunteers her time to transcribe it, and our whole McDermott Road Church family who make it possible for us to provide this Bible study for you. Now, let's go out and love like Jesus.